Friday service. We be, will begin this evening with a 10 minute meditation prior to our service beginning. So I invite you to get comfortable, close your eyes, and take a nice relaxing breath. And for the next 10 minutes, I invite you to keep your focus on your breath. It may help you to silently say to yourself, breathing in as you inhale and breathing out as you exhale. If your mind wanders without judgment, just notice where it has wandered. Perhaps label this as thinking, hearing, or feeling. And then very gently and compassionately, bring your attention back to your breath, back into the present moment, breathing in and breathing out.
As our meditation comes to a close, I invite you to bring your awareness back into your body, becoming aware of your surroundings. I invite you to take a nice, deep breath. And as you release it, open your eyes. Once again, welcome to our special Good Friday virtual service. A special welcome to those of you who joined us during the meditation. I invite you all to please join me in prayer. As we turn our attention inward, we join together within this one life of God in which we all live and that lives within and around each and every one of us. I know that we are all expressions of this one life, filled and surrounded by God's nature. And knowing that God is present in all beings and in all situations, I know that God is present and unfolding through every part of this Good Friday service, through our coming together via virtual technology, through all those who are of service, through our music, our thoughts, the words shared, and the moments in silence. I know that everything unfolds in divine grace and order. I know that we are all awakened to our divine nature that is greater than any of our human circumstances, even those that we feel are our own personal crucifixions. I know that we are all blessed to be together and that great healing and revealing occurs throughout this service. And so, I give thanks for all the blessings we experience this evening. And in deep gratitude, I release this word, knowing that it is already fulfilled in the mind of God. And so it is, and together we say, Amen. Now please join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, Tina. Good evening. So our service this evening offers a metaphysical view of the events of Good Friday, meaning that we don't simply look at this as a historic event that happened 2,000 years ago. Instead, we'll look at it from the perspective of how this story is personally meaningful to us, how the characters and events represent aspects of our own thoughts and behavioral patterns. We particularly focus on teachings that Jesus delivered from the cross and how we can apply them to our own crucifixion experiences. So to better understand the events of that day, let's step back about 2,000 years to the year 33 AD into the Jewish city holy city of Jerusalem, which is currently under Roman occupation, run by the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. So the city is filled to capacity by Jews from all over who gather to celebrate Passover, a holiday we're celebrating right now. It's the important Jewish holiday that celebrates a time when the Jews escaped from Egypt, where they lived in slavery, and began their journey to the promised land. The Jews gathered here are most likely aware of the irony that while they're here to celebrate this holiday whose theme is freedom, their holy city is under foreign occupation. They'd probably love to reclaim it for themselves. So Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, has a lot at stake here. His career depends on his ability to maintain law and order in this city. If things get out of hand, which they very well could, he probably doesn't have enough troops to do the job. Now, present among these thousands of people are an itinerant rabbi by the name of Jesus and his handful of disciples. Some say he's the long-awaited Messiah who's come to free his people from the Roman occupation. And while his followers believe this, there are many prominent members amongst his fellow Jews, high priests, scribes, and Pharisees, who rebuke this idea and actually feel threatened by his presence. Why? Well, for one, they've heard that Jesus' followers call him the Son of God and are worshiping him. The key tenet of their religion has been no other gods before me. Time and time again, their prophets have said all the hardships, all the captivities that their people have faced have been the result of worshiping false gods or failing to follow the rules of the Torah. This rabbi is known to have openly broken the Jewish law of refrain, refraining from work on the Sabbath by healing a man on this holy day. He's publicly denounced Pharisees, those who strictly observe Jewish law, as hypocrites. He told a story of a good Samaritan. Samaritans were known to practice a form of Judaism that was not accepted and was looked down upon by Jewish society. And in the Holy Temple of Jerusalem, he created a major stir by showing outrage for traditions such as 
selling goods and animal sacrifice that have been practiced here for over a thousand years. From the perspective of the high priests and others, Jesus' ministry could bring the wrath of God upon the Jewish people as a whole. Now, the Jews have been charged with the crime of Jesus' crucifixion for 2,000 years, but the fact is that only Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, could order his execution. Why would he? Well, the Romans see Jesus as a potential leader of an insurrection against the Roman rule in Jerusalem. And remember, they are far outnumbered at this point. They know that they could put themselves in good standing by collaborating with those influential Jews who want to get rid of Jesus. So the bottom line is, it was fear of radical change and the suffering that it might bring about that led to Jesus' crucifixion. In recognizing this, we can ask, how do we react in such situations? Don't we fall into patterns of crucifying others with our thoughts, words, or deeds when their ways seem threatening to us? Has anyone noticed some of the posts on Facebook and Twitter these days? Has anyone uh, noticed how social media has become an avenue to verbally crucify those whose ideologies clash with ours? Do we not crucify ourselves for our failures and our transgressions, forgetting that we can call forth God's nature in us all to learn from and grow and make good of errors and our transgressions? Is our world really free of crucifixion mentality? And so Jesus was crucified at Golgotha, the place of the skull, where the Romans carried out these executions. So in his last hours on earth, while Jesus was dying on the cross, he made seven statements that can serve as lessons for all of us to go, learn from and to use for overcoming crucifixion experiences. Many of those who wanted to see Jesus executed gathered to mock him at the foot of the cross and challenge him to prove that he was the son of God by saving himself. And when he didn't, they taunted him with phrases such as, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. And to this, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. One of the malefactors who was being crucified alongside him recognized Jesus' goodness and innocence, and he said to Jesus, Remember me, O Lord, when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And as Jesus looked down from the cross, he noticed his mother Mary and his disciple John, whom he deeply loved. And he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to John, Behold your mother. And from that very hour, the disciple took Jesus' mother with him. And then at around 3 p.m., when darkness had spread over the land, Jesus cried out. According to the Lamsa translation of the Bible, he said, My God, my God, for this I was spared, or this is my destiny. And then, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. And they gave him to drink vinegar mixed with gall, which would have sedated him. And he tasted it, but he would not drink. Jesus said, it is fulfilled. Then he cried with a loud voice, saying, O oh, my Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. He said this, and it was finished. And so... The stage is now set for Jesus' resurrection, Easter, three days later, his triumph over death. So metaphysically speaking, crucifixion represents the crossing out of false beliefs of being separate from God. It's the death of the ego that identifies or clings to things in the world. 
we know that Jesus' crucifixion leads to his resurrection, reminding us that no matter how painful our own crucifixion experiences may seem, our spiritual essence remains unscathed. He shows us that while it may be difficult to surrender our ego-based needs, doing so allows our spiritual essence to be more fully expressed. Also, in forgiving those who transgress against him, Jesus demonstrates that he recognizes their spiritual potential that's greater than their actions. He reminds us that God's nature in us all is greater than our transgressions, and we all have the opportunity to rise above them. So on whatever side of the crucifixion experience we find ourselves, crucifier or crucified, the spirit of God, the untainted goodness in us will eventually prevail. We can all awaken to our divine essence. And in this teaching, we believe we all will. And we all can arise from the self-created tomb of the ego. And that's the message of this holiday. And so now our practitioners, Bill Carpenter, Mary Hyland, and Robin Wolford, along with our beloved Reverend Nadine, will help us better understand the seven statements Jesus made from the cross and how they're relevant to us. We call these statements the seven steps to overcoming. And they're offered so that you might find your own pathway through any sort of crucifixion experience of your own. The first statement Jesus makes from the cross is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He invites us to forgive all offense, to affirm, I fully and freely forgive all who have offended me. This powerful statement of Jesus may be the most difficult to accept and do which points to the heavy burden we carry with resentment and unforgiveness. If we think forgiveness means condoning, accepting unacceptable behavior, then yes, very challenging. If we realize we are all one, it starts to become easier. I sincerely believe that there is within each of us that which is pure, innocent, and never touched by the world. If we are made in the image of the divine, part of the whole of a spirit, then we are truly freeing ourselves in forgiving. One day I just got that a person acts out from hate or resentment because they are unknowing, unconscious of what they are doing at the deepest level, hurting, poisoning themselves in this inescapable oneness. When someone lives with darkness, pain, fear, that part can hurt others but it is not the real self, and it knows not what it does. I have always been struck when I have read of the Amish or Jews forgiving murder, or innocent prisoners forgiving, that they knew they could never be free if they held on. I've had trouble forgiving some hurtful, hateful happenings of the past few years. Our beloved Reverend Mark said something a while ago that I've been using daily. Bless them with their good at the expense of no one. Their capital G good, the spiritual qualities, peace, abundance, light, and love. People do not and cannot harm others when they're filled with spirit, love. So I pray to see who they really are and bless them and feel the overcoming lightness Forgiveness rising up in me, a feeling of healing for all, and I feel free and peaceful. I invite you to join me in affirming, I fully and freely forgive all who have offended me. the face of 
God. You are the face of God. I hold you in my heart. You are a part of me. You are the face of God. You are the face of God. I hold you in my heart. You are a part of me. You are the face of God. You are the face of God. the face of God. The second statement Jesus makes from the cross is, Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. He invites us to release the past and bring the future into the present to affirm. I declare my good in the ever-present now. Let us focus on releasing the past and begin to live in that present moment, not rehashing about what different declarations you could have made here or there that may have changed the outcome, but knowing that in this moment you are making the correct decision now. Be compassionate with yourself. In looking back at the past, stuck in the memories, can take away from the good that is, in, that is available in this present moment. If we release those memories of which we have no control to change the outcome and bring our focus into the good that is here and now, becoming one with God, that Holy Spirit within, allows that awareness to move our thoughts and actions into the now. To be with God in paradise is a statement about us seeking the kingdom of God within our own spiritual awareness, that oneness that is God, the here and now. How does this oneness show up for you? Think about that. As we bring our awareness our desire for good, our thoughts will take us there. From Ernest Holmes, our founder, whatever good we may desire must be accepted as the present reality of our experience. In allowing the past to be behind us, the good, the very good of the kingdom of God, that paradise that we seek is right here. As we breathe in, and breathe out, we have the choice to continue to remain in the past or move forward in the present moment, seeking all the good that is available to us here, now, and forever, knowing that all is good. So please affirm, I declare my good in the ever-present now. The third statement Jesus makes from the cross is, Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. He invites us to discharge all obligations with love, to affirm, I discharge my worldly obligations with love. Mary is Jesus' mother, and some scholars feel John was his closest disciple, 
and they are watching their beloved one being crucified. We all have times in our lives when we had to let go of something or someone that we loved, felt committed to, and did not want to release. Yet Jesus teaches us that when it is time to release these worldly obligations and experiences, we should do so with gratitude, forgiveness, and love. We discharge the worldly obligations, the fear beliefs, the customs, and traditions that hold us back. That which is not our responsibility and replace it with gratitude, forgiveness, and love. Taking responsibility for ourselves sometimes hurts, yet we have a choice. If we choose resentment, we hurt ourselves and we push others away. The soul consciousness in each individual is capable of the strongest, deepest, and fullest allegiance to truth. It is constantly seeking something that will satisfy. It can never be happy or at peace until the feelings are redeemed and harmonized with the goodness of spirit. Until God's presence is known and felt and fully realized throughout the individual being. Jesus shows us that even in the most difficult and painful situations, it is possible to release with love. To affirm, I discharge my worldly obligations with love. The fourth statement that Jesus makes is, my God, my God, this is my destiny. He invites us to accept our right to be healed, to accept and transcend this current challenge, and to affirm, I accept it as my destiny to overcome. Here Jesus reminds us that we all have our unique destinies to fulfill. We may face seeming obstacles, losses, health, financial, or relationship challenges. However, when we remember who we truly are, expressions of God, we come to realize that only good can come to us. The human part of us may argue with this. It is difficult to see and realize. We just want the challenge to go away, yet, there is always an opportunity in whatever we are facing, no matter how challenging it is. When I was 25 years old, I was diagnosed with an infertility disease. The doctor said that my chances were slim to none that I would ever become pregnant. I went to work on myself with spiritual mind treatment. I changed my fear to acceptance. I made peace with my destiny, and six years later, I had my son. 
The primary cause of unhappiness is never the situation, but our thoughts about it. If we wish to demonstrate, to manifest, to experience our heart's desires, we have to enter into the kingdom of God within us. It is the God essence of us. It is fearless because it is who we truly are, divine spiritual beings and one with God. When we know that it's all God and it's all good, then there's an opportunity. Whatever fat challenges we are facing, we can find the good and we can grow and expand our state of consciousness. Listen to your heart. Your heart knows why you are here. Let it be your guide as you align with your destiny, just as Jesus did. He accepted his destiny to overcome the suffering that he would have experienced had he resented or felt overwhelmed by his circumstances. We too, can accept our challenges, whether they are illness, financial, relationship losses. We must let go of fear, knowing that all things work together for good. So once again, we affirm, I accept it as my destiny to overcome. Jesus' fifth statement from the cross is, I thirst. He invites us to allow ourselves to desire the healing, to affirm, I fervently desire my healing. I believe many of us are here because we have felt this, our soul thirsting for a knowingness of oneness and peace, for coming back to our source, love. Thirst may feel like a suffering at first, Yet thankfully, this thirst can be fulfilled, but not by material things. Jesus acknowledged thirst, but knew it could not be satisfied with sedation and bitterness. This thirst is a noble, worthy pursuit, a motivator to seek our expansion, our overcoming. It suggests we are willing to be healed and transformed. As our teacher Emma Curtis Hopkins said, there is good for me, and I ought to have it. I have had physical challenges, a thirst for relief of pain or discomfort, where I refused to give in, stayed communing with God, and felt well and healed soon after. I know the temptation to eat chocolate cake when a discomfort or divine discontent arises, when the thirst filler might be to take a walk in nature instead. I wake up every morning with this feeling of thirst, the longing for truth, deep spiritual fulfillment, and I'm grateful for that fervent desire to center and anchor in spirit before I start my day. It is almost a physical thirst, which feels like it must be obeyed. So I do my spiritual practice, meditate, read, pray, and feel that click of connection and then a deeper peace and readiness for my day. So we can know that when we thirst, are open, honest, and willing, we can be healed, filled, and fulfilled. Let us affirm, I fervently desire my healing. <laughs> God is 
The sixth statement Jesus makes from the cross is, it is fulfilled. He invites us to declare fulfillment, to affirm, I behold my good as fulfilled. In thinking about fulfillment, there is a sense of trying to grasp hold of a moving target. If my good is what I am striving for, focusing on my awareness of all of God's grace, that spiritual goodness is that in everyone and everything that is in my life. Is there a time when I will reach a point and there is nothing left to do? This seems to be the point where Jesus is at in his human experience. In this human experience, we have strive to grow spiritually, focused on our good, and then comes another growing experience to work through. Each experience that is presented in our lives gives us a new insight, a different way of looking at how to work through this. Some experiences are really decisions we make right then and there. Like such, do I sleep in for 10 minutes and maybe miss that much of my spiritual practice? Is it worth it? Oh. So as, while there are these experiences that seem to linger on, we let them take up space in our minds, distracting us from our good here in the present moment. Meditation and journaling are spiritual tools that can help us move into our awareness of what is mine to, to learn. How do I move forward? There is a story I read about a kayaker applying the rules of kayaking to the challenges of life. Don't look at the dangers, the rocks. Keep the focus on the path towards your good. The annoyances, big and small, were just that. And she just focused on staying on the path that was for her good, the ultimate goal of being happier. As you work through life, surrender to the experience and what there is to learn, knowing that life is always changing and as we grow spiritually with these experiences, that God within us is always there and supportive as we continue to move forward. And let's affirm, I behold my good as fulfilled. The final statement Jesus utters from the cross is, O my Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. He said this and it was finished. He invites us to let go and let God. To affirm, I let go and let God work through me. Metaphysically, the crucifixion is giving up of the personality. Jesus' crucifixion is a complete surrender of self. Wayne Dyer used to say, the whole enchilada. We can all feel crucified at times in our personal life and in what we witness in the world. Many spiritual traditions talk about surrender. In surrender, we give up our personality, the self-seeking, selfishness, and the judgmental thinking and actions. And we ask spirit to take over the situation. When we get out of the way and move to allowing, we open to the infinite spirit. We are admitting to our, that our ego self cannot always see the whole picture, cannot always see the greater good that's to be realized. When we stop completely and accept our situation, and then give it to God, saying, O oh my Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. 
We surrender to the presence that knows all solutions to worldly problems, that life force where all things are possible. And we allow it to move through the situation and to move us through the situation. In complete acceptance, we open to the greater good that spirit holds for us all. We affirm, I let go and I let God work through me. So before we bring our service to a close with Tina gifting us with another beautiful solo and our benediction, let's take this time right now for our affirmative giving. Uh, we hope this service has been meaningful to you. And we just remind you that uh, you can give your donation in uh, several different ways. One is if you'd like to call the church office, we'll be here for about 15 minutes after the service. You can make a donation over the phone with your credit or debit card. Uh, second would be online. You should be seeing a link uh, that can connect you straight to our donation page. It's nhcrs.org and then forward slash give. And also you can text the word give to area code 818 uh, four five seven three four one nine. And however you choose to support us, we always, always are so grateful and love that you're supporting us so we can be here to continue to support you. So with that, let's hold our hands to our hearts as we set our intentions for these gifts, these offerings. From the love of pure spirit within me, I bless this gift. I send it forth to heal and bless and prosper. It is evidence of my faith and belief. It does good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly. Thank you. Also, uh, before I turn this back over to Tina, I want to say thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you, thank you everyone who has been part of this service this evening and all of you out there in virtual land who are supporting us. Uh, it's been just such a beautiful collaborative experience. Uh, I can't thank you enough. Um, I also want to uh, say a special word of gratitude to practitioner emeritus Catherine Christie, who originally created the service and authored many parts of it this years ago. Thank you so much, Catherine. And of course, thanks to all of you for joining us. We hope that you'll uh, join us again this coming Sunday at 9.45 a.m. for our virtual Easter Sunday service with our beloved Dr. Mark Vieira. Blessings to all.
so indeed, it is always well with our souls. For truly, God's love, light, and goodness lie within and around us at all times. I'm so, so grateful for all the ways that this nature of the divine has flowed through our time together this evening. I know that we go forward with a deeper awareness that God's nature in us is indestructible and that we can always depend on it to show us the way to rise above any of our own human crucifixion experiences. Hmm. I'm so grateful for the many blessings we have all received throughout the service and in deep gratitude I release this word knowing it is already so, and so it is, and together we say, Amen. Thanks again for joining us, everyone. Looking forward to us being together again virtually on Easter Sunday. Good night.